That was not loud enough! Yes, welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of the General Gaming Show here. I am General Gaming reporting for... No, we're not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> I am Bridger. I will be your host for today. We are talking about a lot of different things, but specifically the topic on today's show is free-to-play games. That's right, games where you can get into it and start playing it for free... And there may be some pay-to-win elements in there, too. We'll talk about pay-to-win, the elephant in the room, as well as what games really lend themselves to being free-to-play, what games succeeded at it, what are the different things that you can wind up paying for in microtransactions, etc. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting things to talk about, but before we go there, let me quickly introduce my co-hosts here. We've got Freelancer from Team Legacy. Welcome, sir. Not meaning to imply that I'm not from Team Legacy. We are from... <laughs> we're all from the team. I don't have my shirt on today. It was ruined by the cat. But that's another story entirely. Also joining us, uh, apparently it's great. Hello, great mm. to Brett. I'm, that's I'm one thing great. I didn't check. <laughs> there we go. Now he's, now he's got the right title. Uh, so welcome, sir. <laughs> good to see you again. We had great on last week where we talked about indie games. That was a very good discussion. Uh, and uh, glad that we're able to keep uh, talking about these. I can't wait till we talk about Rome 2. Rome 2 came on the news. They said it is the fastest pre-ordered Total War game that has ever existed. Yeah, I sort of helped with that. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't surprise me, though. I mean, it's the... it's. I don't know. Is there... The first Rome game has always struck me as my favorite, but I've got an affinity for that era, I guess. I never played Shogun 2, but I know everybody said that's really good, too. Well, the very concept of Total War games is that you micromanage your army and the structure and stuff, and who did that better than the Romans, you know? So when it came to, uh, you know, the actual atmosphere of the battles, uh, I think the Rome era is what we all remember. You know, it's the the super complex legion structure that um, is very enjoyable. Absolutely. That's, I think, coming out in September, and the time can't pass fast enough for my taste. But the good news is, in the meantime, we have a lot of free-to-play games that are either in beta slash coming out or already out. And before I started coming up with the idea for this show, I really didn't realize how the business model was just taking over gaming, even hardcore gaming. I mean, we've known that it started in the Farmville, Zynga type areas, but it's it's so vast and expanding. We'll talk all about that in a second, but we will talk about one of them right now very briefly, and that is uh, what what Freelancer and I have been playing, along with the rest of Team Legacy for the past week or two, is, uh, is Star Conflict, which is a very interesting game. Um, and, uh, and, and that is a, a really cool sort of third person third ship i guess uh game about uh i don't know does third ship work <laughs> I, I would i would say it, the easiest way to explain it is if you played eve online and you enjoyed the atmosphere of eve online but you take away all the macro management and just kind of pull out the dog fighting you know and pull out the uh space combat function of eve online then you have star conflict uh the quip you know, the way you set up your ships and everything similar is very similar to EVE. Anybody that's played EVE will immediately be accustomed to the way Star Conflict works. But it's much faster paced. It's much, you know... Uh, There's a lot more it's, twitch it's and a positioning. A lot less menu clicking. It's like if you took <laughs> EVE Online and added a battleground option. <laughs> that's what it is. Without the capital ships and stuff like that. Yeah, but still, but the combat in EVE is, like I said, it's really so much clicking on menus. Like, you tell your ship to orbit something, and then your ship does everything automatically. You tell it to fire the lasers, it aims and fires the layers, lasers automatically. And there's some, I mean, there's certainly a lot of fun to be had in EVE. I don't want to belittle EVE, but there's not as much direct Twitch input to be had from the player. And Star Conflict is like, let's remedy that. Let's take the, the, the concepts in EVE, uh, and and the, the like you're talking about the modules and the different types of damage and the different ways you can boost your ship and different kinds of roles of ships. They even use the same verb verbiage 
they call ships that are supposed to get in close and lock down an enemy ship, they call those tacklers. That's a that's a phrase or, or, a, or a nomenclature that has evolved in EVE Online. So uh, the, those kinds of things are very similar, but it has a lot of charm to it too. It's, it's very pretty looking and the positioning aspect is really important and the, the, the maps have all these different asteroids that you can see that you can try to use to either hide behind or use to, to get out of line of sight and dodge missiles. And it's, it's got a lot of interesting choices with how to engage your opponent and when to run and when to hide and when to jump out from behind an asteroid. And the team aspect is really good too. Yeah, it is. Um, it's very, it's, this is one of those games where if you have a, a teamwork setting, if you got a group of guys, um, unfortunately you can only queue with four other or three other people, but when you do have that group, some of these game modes are almost, it's almost impossible to lose as long as you're communicating. Um, in, in general, like the, uh, there's a VIP mode, which we all remember from like Counter-Strike and similar games, mm -hmm. where there's that one guy you have to assassinate. And if you have a, a group of buddies that can move together as sort of a strike group and dive in on this guy, it's far more effective than just, you know, random people flying all around and maybe one or two people engaging that VIP at one time. It's far different than having a bunch of people that can uh, coordinate a burst, you know, all at the same time. It's, you see it every time. I've been playing a ton and if I see like a group of guys with the same tag, and we're playing certain game modes, then you know immediately you have to play differently because they're going to bring a different concept to it. Yeah, and I believe that the they're going to allow you to queue with more than just four people total uh, in the future. It still is technically in beta. They're in version 0.8. Point two or something to that effect, and it's uh, made by the same people who made another game called War Thunder, which had the same issue. Where and I guess World of uh, Tanks does the same kind of thing, where you can only queue, and so does League of Legends. You can only queue with up to X people, and then you have to have a full group. So I'm guessing they're going to add full queuing, so you can have like a full group of twelve or eight or ten or whatever their you know max number of players will be in that mode some point in the future. But it's definitely a lot of fun. It is inertialess, by the way. There's no such thing as inertia in this game, and the way they explain that is your ship automatically compensates for inertia. So if you take your foot off the gas, then your ship will slow down by default, and you can turn on a dime. There's it's it's it's, it's, it's air, aircraft in space is what it is. But it's still a lot of fun if you ignore the science part of your brain screaming that that doesn't that doesn't happen right there. That's not that doesn't make sense. <laughs> but I, I definitely recommend checking it out. And we'll be talking a lot more about uh, Star Citizen and other free to play games in the uh, in the in the later section. So let's quickly discuss uh, a very interesting game that <laughs> Tibret is bringing to the, this Rosenkreuzlet. Rosenkreuzlet, I think is yeah. How you pronounce it? It's a. Uh, I forget when it came out. It had to be around the year 2000. It's a Mega Man clone made by a Japanese developer, where the the kind of mechanics and the schematic of every level was based heavily in Mega Man, but then the theme of every level was based heavily in kind of a different uh, retro game. Like I think this is supposed to be the Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Ish level. <laughs> There's one that looks like Bomberman. There's another one that looks like Castlevania, and it's uh, Mega Man to me was always the the one game that had that play to to master aspect of to of a uh, yeah of it to it where you would just go and die on the same level until you would memorized everything you had to do, and that's how it would generate fun. I guess <laughs> it would generate fun, huh? So that's kind of like a Super Meat Boy aspect to it. Yeah, it's so frustrating and that when you I'm complete so, it, you I'm feel so, so happy good. you you apparently loaded on one of the sections where I was doing fairly well instead of one of the many sections of this video where I was doing terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you look impressive here. You still got ninety percent of your health. It's all yeah, good. Well, the only reason I know that is because I fought that one skilled dude about fifty times. <laughs> in... <laughs> but yeah, if you're, I think it's still around ten dollars. You have to have Google Translate on so that you can understand the Japanese site you have to buy it from. But for 10 bucks, it's a, it's a really good Mega Man clone. All right, you should put a link, or maybe we'll do a quick Google search. We'll put the link in the show notes because I don't think people are going to be able to search for Rosenkreuzillette just by hearing the word. 
<laughs> Just search for like anime girl Mega Man and you probably will find it. <laughs> I'm guessing. All right, so that is uh, an interesting, interesting game right there. I'll throw the name into the chat because people in the chat are probably like, what the hell is that? Um, it actually, Google corrected your spelling, by the way. Oh, God. <laughs> it recognizes it. Right? it. It what, does what, correctly was recognize it. Was it UE instead of EU? I always do that wrong. No, it's one L instead of two, apparently. Oh. <laughs> Google Go knows all. Google does know all. It even knows the weird name. That must be a that must be something in German that I don't know. Anyway, yeah. uh, there is an interesting bit of news this week that I wanted to talk about. Actually, it was last week, but um, one of StarCraft's more famous players fired for abusive behavior, comma ongoing ass hattery that is a brilliant brilliant uh, uh piece of oh you know what we need to go here that was a brilliant piece of uh of title writing by the uh the people over at the penny arcade report uh idra is the name that many people who follow the starcraft scene might know uh i have heard that name myself a number of times he was at pax a couple of times while i was there they had one of those try and beat the famed idra so he's a he's a very uh well-known player but he's also well known for uh, for his anger issues. I think freelancer, you played a lot of StarCraft too back in the day as well. Uh, did you ever uh, watch any of his streams and view view this firsthand? I've actually spoken with him, um, but he you got. I, I come from a different perspective, Bridger. I, I think we're gonna disagree here. For him and the guys that I know that speak to him regularly, he. He he puts on a persona. It's it really is for the large part an act on his part. Um, it's ima imagine this, okay? How many players in the United States are trying to be pro or, or so called, you know, semi pro or pro, and then how many of those players will ever actually be noticed? See, his his approach to it was to create a branding for himself or an image for himself by. Uh, you know, by let's just say acting a very certain way that we all know. And it worked. And see, everybody across the board that did play StarCraft II at any level and watched Idra and stuff, he was amazing at Zerg. Okay. He was amazing at certain things. But compared to so many other, you know, U.S. players, he wasn't necessarily the poster child of a U.S. you know esports star, but he made himself into that position by creating a brand for himself, and um, you know I think half of I think the majority of what we hear about him, what we see from him, his raging in chat, the way he composes himself in chat, really is a you know um, I don't have the word here, the, but just the the character yeah, that you're for, talking about that he for a, right. a persona. A yeah, persona. A persona. There you go. He's, and, um, he's, he's the he's the Mac and Row of StarCraft Two. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it's it just in general. I, I mean, I'm not going to go as far as saying that that's how he is in real life. Is what is what I'm getting at. You know, I there's a certain if if you see him like when he's at PAX and when he's at Gamescom and when he's doing these various tournaments. If you ever catch him off camera, like when he isn't doing the middle of a match and stuff, he he composes himself very differently. He is generally introverted. He's very quiet. You know, he he doesn't go out lashing against people. But when he gets in front of the spotlight, in front of the camera, it's like he flips to this, you know, evil Idra virgin <laughs> that you know that has to tear and rip everybody else apart. And you see that. Like any psychologist can very vividly see that when he's in spotlight, when he's not. So, so this is actually the the reasoning for, or at least the public reasoning for why he was fired is. He has been known to, and I guess recently has done it twice, quit matches. Well, that's not why he was fired. No, but that's that's one of the one of the examples being uh, being. Used I mean, the in biggest report. moments in, in Google search or YouTube search can find that the biggest moments moments people that aren't really familiar with them remember is things like when he he quit matches, um, or we can call it rage quitting when he felt he was losing like he had the tendency and this was a real fault of his to he he was over analytical he would see the game play out 10 minutes ahead of time when it didn't actually play out that way so there was instances where he would go up against somebody and um, one of the more famous ones was the hallucinations uh, he would go up against the player uh, this one he did go up against this one player tip uh, tip my tongue uh, really highly publicized match and mass hallucinations okay 
And so the, the opponent, uh, one of the abilities in this game that the Protoss have, which is this alien, alien type race that with super advanced technology, is they can hallucinate all of their units and make them appear like they have a much larger army than normal. And that's what we're viewing right now, I think is the one you're talking right about. Here. Yeah. So what you see going on right now is that this Protoss army, the, the ones you see with the blue and the lasers and stuff, are actually, for the large part, fake. They don't do any damage. They don't, they're just there, but they appear large. And uh, taking a chapter out of Sun Tzu here, his giant army is coming to Idra's very small. You know, he's got some Zerglings, Guardians, and stuff there. And Idra is just like, you know what? I lose. And since I'm going to lose my army and there's nothing I can do to stop this, he quits the game. Little does he know that the entire, th almost the entire thing was hallucinated, and he actually had the upper hand by far. And uh, that's not the only game he's done. He's done various other games where... Uh, there was another game versus a Terran player um, where the it appeared as though the Terran player was was winning because he did a three-pronged attack. He thought he had lost because he didn't pay attention to where his units were, and he quit the game entirely. And uh, that was ca casted by Day9 and Artosis. And that was another big one where Day9 was just like, what? You know? <laughs> and it was just, it was Idra once again trying to be too analytical, getting ahead of, ahead of himself, and then quitting the game. But um, what makes Idra famous, and this is what you can YouTube search if you want some good laughs, is just the way he rages and talks in chat and riles up his enemies and gets them all worked up and tells them they're bad and, you know, you should you should kill yourself for playing Terran, you know, and stuff. <laughs> you know, things like that. And does he mean it or does it there? It doesn't he mean it? You, you don't really know. But you know what occurs to me is I read a very an article on the Penny Arcade Report I think that was talking about how esports uh, is not a title that the fighting game community wants applied to it because they do a very similar thing. Like it's embraced by their community. It comes from that arcade spirit of you're playing the the on the stick right next to somebody and you're using psychological warfare against them and like trying to psych them out. That's a huge part of that community's competitive game is trying to psych out your opponent by you know talking down to them, etc. And they understand that it's part of the game. It's part of the competition. It's the meta game on top, and that they don't want esports to ever come to fighting games, so to speak, because they see that as you know they would have people like oh, well, telling you you have to dress in suits and be nice and sportsmanlike and not ever try and do any of that, which is kind of what Idra is falling into here. Is he's got mm. people and sponsors saying you can't do that. You're you're making us look well, bad. No, no, no. See the thing. The, the main reason Idra was let go wasn't because of the way he carries himself on uh, tournaments or against anybody. That, that's, that's a mistake if you think it was because of that. Okay. The reason he was let go is because of the way on how he turned it towards his fans. Um, there was a fine line drawn where it was okay by EG, uh, Evil Geniuses, that he is more than welcome to speak you know, to his opponent and rile him up or talk trash and stuff because people bought into that. It was all about spectatorship, you know, and people love tuning into Idra's stream not to watch him play because he wasn't really all that magnificent compared to a lot of these Korean players, but because he's just funny and he's interesting and he keeps it fresh. But when he started, uh, and it happened specifically in a Team Liquid thread, when he started turning it onto his fans, and insulting them well then that sort of is, it, it crosses a very moral line it's like these are the guys that are supporting you you know that mm -hmm. think you're funny and think you're you're witty and now you're taking out your frustration on them and he did that more than a, a few instances and it finally came down to a, a team liquid thread last uh i think it was almost two weeks ago actually uh where he just went off completely on somebody and threw out a few choice words. Um, I think the quote here is yeah. one of the specific ones <laughs> That's where it, yep. he says, Nope, you're all a bunch of fucks. It just so happens I get to pay to treat you like it. Uh, uh, treat you like it. And it's yeah. fucking awesome. Yeah, so the thing is, though, the big key thing for the Evil Geniuses managers um, was that he's not speaking to another player here. He, You go through his profile on Team Liquid. He's always throwing sort of comments like that, you know, to other players, especially a few select ones that he never liked. Um, and it's funny, but this right here, he's attacking directly the fans. And the and fans that, are the ones that support the whole thing. Yes. And so 
it, it's he lost a lot of fans, but more importantly, it's just kind of crossed that line. I think that you know was drawn there, and they had to let him go because now it's it, it was sort of going too far, you know. And and I think they probably we don't see all this, of course, but I think maybe they tried to talk to him about it. And being you know the personality type he was, he got even worse about it. You know, I could say what I want and stuff like that. There's no telling, but mm-hmm. that was the reason he was let go. It's it, in essence, and a lot of people argue this, StarCraft II needed him and needed more guys like him. I know that sounds awful, but StarCraft II wasn't exactly the biggest spectator sport like StarCraft Brood War was. And he was big in Brood Wars and such, but to draw the U.S. crowd in, because it's huge in Korea and Seoul, mm-hmm. um, it, to bring the StarCraft II crowd in, at least the U.S. side, the Western world, they needed more players like him and Artosis and Day9 and stuff. And losing him, and this is a hot debate even now, losing him, um, he's not, well, he's not officially lost. He's now moving to other things like Spectator and uh, casting matches and stuff like that. But there's a lot of debate thinking that this might hurt StarCraft II and hurt Evil Geniuses far more than ever, you know, than it would keeping him on. Okay, so that is uh, that. It's a very interesting, and, and it's certainly a big difference, and I think that, like you said, the key is the difference between jabbing at other players and, and starting to go after the fans. That's certainly something that, that, that seems like that crossed the line. And uh, I think that, like you said, characters and personas are one of the major things in any kind of spectator sport. Uh, that's, that's, that's a key feature to pretty much all sports in general. All right, absolutely. so... Sorry? I said absolutely, yeah. Okay, all so... Let's move on then to our free-to-play discussion. Uh, there are an awful lot of free-to-play games coming out. And, and what's more interesting is a lot of the free-to-play games are revitalizing genres that died years ago, decade ago, in some cases. You've got MechWarrior Online bringing back the sort of slow, ponderous mech simulator games, which died way back with Mech 4. We haven't seen any games like that come out and succeed since Mech MechWarrior 4. So MechWarrior Online comes out and is doing fairly well as far as I can tell. You've got uh, Tribes Ascend bringing back the Tribes-style gameplay, which hasn't been embraced in any form uh, since, I guess you could argue, Tribes Vengeance, but that kind of failed pretty miserably. Uh, Tribes 2 was the last one. That was way back in the early 2000s, wasn't it? Uh, so you've got those coming back, uh, and, and you've got War Thunder bringing back Flight Sims, uh, you've got uh, new genres being created where you have MOBA gameplay brought into a third or first person type perspective with things like Super Monday Night Combat and Smite. And so you've got all these, it's just a massive amount of things that are different than what's currently going on in games. So there's a lot of different reasons for that and that's what we're going to explore today. Uh, so the first thing I want to do though is start with something that I sort of came to the conclusion a long time ago, but as I was researching this, I was going through articles on Gama Sutra and other sites, and it just, it, it made me sick to my stomach, the kinds of things that were in those. So I'm going to start with a statement, I just want to hear the reactions of my co-hosts here. Free-to-play games are coercive and purposefully frustrating, and leads to extremely poor or less fun design when it's not kept in careful check. Thoughts. What are your What are you guys' thoughts about my statement there? I'm gonna go with mostly true, <laughs> or entirely true. I mean, I, I see a lot of times people will make excuses for free to play games pay aspects because it's free to play. They'll use its freeness as somehow an excuse for its poor design elements. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll you'll make some valid point about oh this progression is too slow or you know this the balance is, is this. off this unit is way yeah. too strong and then they go oh, what do you want it's a free to play game and it's like just because it's free doesn't mean that I'm going to excuse it being bad. Mm-hmm. Definitely freelancer. You know, oh sorry, it's, go, finish your thought. Uh, my 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 last thought was it's like some people have free to play Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's the first I've heard of that. <laughs> uh, you know what though? It's it's it seems like it's it could be true. It, people get invested in a particular game, uh, either invested by time because they've progressed so far in the game, or invested in by actually spending money on it, being one of the founders of Game X or Game Y. And as a result, they everybody, this is a human trait, everybody has a tendency to make excuses for something that they've invested themselves in. So if you bought a new truck or a new car, and it turns out that it gets worse mileage or it breaks down more often than people originally said, you are likely, your first instinct as a human is probably to make excuses for it and say, no, that's just, you know, Ford trying to paint bad things about my baby, you know, Chevrolet or whatever. And that's sort of the, because when we're invested in something, we want to believe that we made a good decision. We don't want to believe that we threw our money away on junk. So you have to actively fight that sort of mental bias that everybody has, the investment bias, essentially. Uh, so, Freelancer, what are your thoughts on my, my statement? Free-to-play uh, business models create coercive and pr purposefully frustrating games. I think this is exactly why there's so much disdain for Korean MMOs, right? Mm. I mean, think about it. Korean MMOs uh, exaggerate in many cases. Uh, it's almost universal, the leveling process. Um, just so you will very quickly be overcome by anybody that buys that so-called booster. And they have a different name for it in every single game. Star Conflict's no exception. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Tribes Ascend, no exception. It's just across the board. I think the universal biggest thing that everybody has an issue with is that if you do not immediately buy into that so-called booster or that enhancer or whatever that gives you more experience or more credits or whatever it is, then you are going to very quickly fall behind with the same, even not even close to the same game time as anybody else who's bought it. And that's that's an issue. Now, there are exceptions. There's games that instead try to make money off of cosmetic things, and that's, that's an entirely different story. But the games typically um, that add these boosters that no matter what, if you don't buy one, you're going to fall behind, that's where I think most people fall in and they sort of, you know, they got to give it a second thought because if you don't have the money to pop down for that booster, you can forget playing competitively with anybody else because you will always be behind in all circumstances. I will point out I disagree with you when you say Tribes is not an exception. I think it is an exception but only as of February when they re release the Game of the Year edition that you can buy for $40 that unlocks everything. And then you can, well, I guess you still have to buy something. But you're right. From a free-to-play perspective, I guess it does fit the mold that you just said. But I have to say that's, I think, the only time I've seen that as an option. So you can play it as a free-to-play game and sort of earn your way to unlocking the classes or the weapons or whatever it is. Then the other option, like you said, is people can buy boosters to speed that process up. And that can cost them a little bit of money. And then this Tribes Ascend is the first one that I've seen that offers, hey, if you just want to buy the full game as if this was a normal game that you could buy, just pay $40. You've unlocked every class and every ability as if you had you know, played a bunch of hours and unlocked them all. You get it from the start. Um, and I'm very impressed and I hope that more of them take that stance because when I get invested in a game I don't want to have my pacing ruined due to the free to pay nature of it Yeah, and I know you went uh, Pretty heavy into planet side too as far as always looking for the weekends where you could make your pay bucks go the extra mile yeah. and the, the only thing I kept thinking every time you brought that up, and it's like, I have to spend this much on this weekend so that I get more money so that I can buy this thing, is wouldn't it be great if there was an option where you could just buy Planet Side 2? Yes! Because yes, the way, would. Because <laughs> how slow you got things in that game made me feel like I would happily pay market, you know, usual value for this game. You yeah. Know, 60 bucks, what have you. I would have thrown that down mm -hmm. and said just don't make me play 15 hours to get not even a quarter of a class complete. Yep, exactly. Exactly. That's my that was that was my whole thought. It's one of the reasons I put the game down. Another other that's, reasons there too, that, but that's entirely the reason I put the game down. Um, it's because I I I never felt I I didn't get that that 
dopamine boost or whatever every once in a while that other games provide by having time-based unlocks. So, you know, in, in League of Legends, and I, I hate to divert to League of Legends so early because I feel like I'm going to go there a lot for good examples. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was leveling up originally, I would say, oh, I got a new summoner spell, or I have a new mastery point that I can now assign. And I, you know, or I have new champions that I can buy. And I felt like there, the gating of the content not only served a, uh, perhaps a monetary value to the company where you might say, oh, I want this thing now, so I'll buy it. But you might not have actually been prepared to own 30 champions right away. In <laughs> fact, you're probably totally unprepared to do that. And uh, for the most part, I feel like the time that it takes you to get to the level cap in that game is appropriately bringing you up to speed so that you can play against the general pool, basically. Yeah, that's a big thing with me and um, I guess the subscription model, why a lot of people argue it's better than the free-to-play model is because typically everybody starts at the same level and for the same amount of time played and the skill generated from that, you're going to be relatively around the same as everybody else still you know, a month down the road or uh, even a week down the road. Whereas in a free-to-play game with these boosters and such, you're, if you, let's say you and this other guy are both played 12 hours for the week. Um, if that guy had a booster, he's going to come at you with, metaphorically, the biggest, most powerful gun in the game and be able to just, you know, wipe you clean, no problem. And you will always have to play catch up to him no matter what. And that's that's a, always been a, a big thing of mine in MMOs. I love the feeling of starting fresh. Not so much about what the game is or what the content is, but starting fresh on an equal playing field with everybody else. You know, mm -hmm. being able to, being able to start um, you know, an, on a new server and wow, like I love doing that. You know, it was it started a, a brand new playing field. You were the same as everybody. Um, you didn't have to worry to, you know, about anything um, unless your skill level didn't account for it. As far as other MMOs and other launches, that's why people like MMO launches in general. They start on a fresh new playing field. Free-to-play games, not so much. Typically, and this is always going to be a fault of it, at least I feel so, if you know a free-to-play game has been out for, let's say, a month or two months, you know right away before you even download the game that you will never be able to compete with somebody that has been running off of boosters the entire time, ever. You know. Yeah. Now, there are yeah, different think... ways to mitigate that. I mean, you have things like World of Tanks and, and other ones that... and I mean, Star, Star uh, Conflict does the same thing where it won't match up new players against players that have been playing with the boosters for months and months. Um, but... Still, that just seems to split the community rather than having everybody play together like in League of Legends or in uh, uh, Tribes Ascend. I, I disagree. I mean, from, from what it sounds like, you're describing a matchmaking system, and I think a matchmaking system so that people of roughly equivalent levels are playing against each other is the best way to let people have interesting matches with people who are roughly the same skill level as them. Yeah. But see, not every game has a matchmaking system. And yeah, and that's, in, that's you know, not every, not every game's going to apply itself to that. Like, an MMO can't really have a matchmaking system for PvE, for instance. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay, so let's, let's sort of back up a second and talk about what are the benefits to the free-to-play model and what are some of the pitfalls? I mean, everybody likes to talk about the pitfalls, but one of the reasons I decided to do this show is because I came across an article that specifically laid out what the benefits to free-to-play are that people overlook a lot of the time. So what do you guys think would be beneficial in the free-to-play model uh, to uh, the consumer? Let's not, I mean, there's plenty of benefits to the, to the people if they can make tons of money, but let's talk about just the consumer. What are the benefits that you might see? Okay, so Bridger, you remember once upon a time when we used to download demos? <gasps> yeah, those were great. <laughs> And you got to play a level and a half, and it said, eh, you're yeah. done. But but the thing about the demos, the, I mean, I haven't downloaded a demo in, in ages, but the thing about demos were you were able to try the game before you committed to it, all right? that's That would be easily the biggest advantage of a free-to-play game. You, you are very quickly able to download the game, get a feel for it, and say, eh, this isn't my game, you know, regardless of whether I'm 
leveled up or not. I just don't like this gameplay, or I don't like this lore, or I don't like, you know, whatever your, your thing is, a free-to-play game allows you to do that. That, would, that, I think, is one of the biggest advantages. Okay, yeah, that, that's, that, I think that kind of goes into the, the barrier of entry thing. Um, and so you've got basically a huge incentive for the developer to create a solid experience to the player because the player is not going to be invested by a $60 investment or a $50 investment or even a $30 investment. If you got new free-to-play people coming to your game after its launch, they're going to be, like you said, just trying the game out. So you have to have something solid there to coerce them to keep playing or at the very least a bunch of shiny new achievements that make them feel good about themselves. But, well... Let's ignore that side of the game uh, for now. But so, yeah, definitely a uh, low barrier to entry. And I think another thing that goes along with that, that the article pointed out, is just your user inter- inter- interface has to be really smooth and easy and simple and clean and educational. The player has to very easily look at what they're doing, figure it out, look at the tooltips, learn the game quickly and easily. You have to teach the player very solid and 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 uh, without ha- forcing them to go to a wiki or anything like that, because if you force them to go somewhere else to learn about your game, they're probably going to give up instead. There are certain players that you're not going to retain because of that. Uh, what else do you think, uh, to Brett? What other benefits does free to play provide to the consumer? Uh, well, especially for the young consumer, the fact simply that it doesn't cost anything. Okay. I remember, you know, <laughs> there you go. Free to play no, games I, I are free to play. Being, I remember being 14, 15 and really loving video games, but not having a lot of money. This is true. And and those two facts of my life were consistently at odds with each other. You know, we laugh at that, but I literally did not have that on my list. That is not something I thought I appreciate. You know, free to play games are good for the consumer because of the user entry and the barriers and the user interface. And Rob's over here going, Yeah, I think it's good because it's free. <laughs> that is very true. That's, That's... Could, I mean, it, it could be a detriment to the other consumers if you don't like playing with younger players. But ah. I, mean, I, I take for granted now the ability to purchase games. But I remember when I had my first job where I was consistently earning money to the point where I could support myself and had enough left over for my hobbies. It was it was a mind blowing experience to look at my paycheck and go and look and do the math and go like I, I could buy anything I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, to Doom, extent, Doom to Grin in the chat says old people know there's no such thing as free. And <laughs> we'll get to that in a second, Doom Grin. <laughs> um so now, the other thing that was something that sort of opened my eyes in the in this article that I was talking about, which you can find in the show notes, I'll, I'll put a link to it in there, is free-to-play games are, live and die based on the retention of players. The goal of the designers is to keep people playing the game and attract new players because they know the longer people play the game, the more money they'll spend, well, most of the time, uh, in most free-to-play models. Uh, so, as a result... It's in the developer's best interest to A, fix community issues, which is like bugs, balance problem, exploits, etc., and B, add things the community of players wants. So there seems to be a much higher rate of listening to and providing uh, direct uh, patches for things that the community is having problems with. And so basically a much higher level of support than most games get. I mean, there are very few publishers out there that will support a game too far past the one year mark. League of Legends has put out new content for what? Almost three years now? Like two, two and a half years? And they're still going strong, yep. putting out new content, patching the game to make sure it's still competitive, getting rid of exploits, getting rid of overpowered characters. They do that on a constant basis. Every two weeks, they've got a new thing going. And that is a result of the desire of the developers to retain players. So that's a, mm-hmm. a positive thing for the community. Um, so let me, any, any other uh, things that can benefit uh, the consumer for the free-to-play model? Mm. Nothing I can really think of off the top of my head, I mean, besides what I said. Yeah. Um, it's it's just very, very easy to get into. I mm. mean, 
but that does bring a lot of problems, which we'll get to, I'm sure. Yep. So the last thing that I could think of, it's not actually a benefit to the consumer per se, but another thing that is a result of the free-to-play model is for whatever reason, they seem to be able to launch with like 50% of their content they would normally launch if this was a full game. Uh, if you look at MechWarrior Online, Hawken, Planetside 2, I think even League of Legends, um, and any of these other ones that we have on this list here, I mean, for example, Super Monday Night Combat launched with two maps. Uh, Planetside 2 launched with one continent. Uh, and eventually expand it out. I mean, they all launch in open beta, basically. And they launch with a lot less content than a full game would normally have because they basically say, we're constantly updating this game. Here's the taste that you guys want. We've created essentially a playable beta. I think that's a trend in in games even outside of the free-to-play model in general. You know, as uh, ever since... I mean, the earliest example I can think of is Minecraft, and then since then, certainly Kickstarter, there's been a big emphasis on bringing players into the community at an earlier level of development mm. because that, in some ways, it helps create a sense of community and a sense of investment. So even if you haven't invested that much money or time, you feel like you're getting in on the ground floor of something, and you get to see it evolve, which is neat. That's true. That's true. Okay, so we talk a lot about the benefits of the free-to-play model. What are some of the pitfalls of the free-to-play model? What are some of the disadvantages to the consumer based on the free-to-play model? Uh, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, they found a way to gate content and make people thank them for it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's... And, and what I mean by that is it's essentially the same as a lot of old MMO schemes for gating content and that you have to do the certain thing or spend, I mean, it used to be just time, but if it was a subscription-based MMO, then time was literally money mm -hmm. in order to do, you know, something. Like, I, I got blown out of the water by people on Planet Side 2 sometimes, and I would look at their loadouts, and they were way better equipped than I was in every way imaginable because I hadn't spent any money to get nice things so that I could go run around the map. Well, you, you bring up a good point. I mean, we're looking at some Star Citizen footage here, and the way that this game works is there's five tiers of ships. Star and Sorry, damn it, I'm going to do that all the time. <laughs> Star Conflict, uh, and there's five tiers of ships that you can fly, and in order to get to the later ships, which have basically more complete loadouts, right? You start with a basic ship with two weapons and, like, two active modules. And then when you go to Tier 2, it gives you a passive module and a couple of active weapon mods. And then when you get to Tier 3, it gives you a few more types of things. And then when you get to Tier 4, a few more. So the game, the full game, isn't really available until you get to Tier 5. That's when you can fully customize your ships. But... That means that the entire games that you're playing in Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, and Tier 4, they're like, okay, this is a bastardized version of the real game. I have to play this crappier game to get to the game I want to play. And that's the, that's the same argument I had about Planetside is I want to play a game where I can use rocket pods on my, on my fighters. I want to play a game where I have the option between armor piercing and anti-personnel on my tanks. But instead, I'm trapped with this game of, okay, you have only one type of turret on your tank, and you have only one option on your fighters, and that's all there is to it. Until you play that crappier version of the game for a long time, you don't get to play the game you want to play. And, oh, that grinds my gears. <laughs> that's all I can say about it. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm, okay. This isn't an anti-progression show. Let's... <laughs> First, point out there are things where progression is good. Specifically, pacing. Pacing is something that's been in games for forever. And I will be here acknowledging that pacing is important. They didn't give you the rocket launcher the first time you step into Half-Life. They give you the crowbar 
right? And then they give you the pistol, and then they give you the assault rifle, and then they give you the shotgun, and then they give you that alien's arm. So it's it's a pacing thing. You get unlocked new things as you go through the game. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying when that pacing is arbitrarily slowed down to a frustrating point, that makes me frustrated! <laughs> I, I think I think that kind of leads into why I th- I think free to play models are inherently flawed for the most part. There are exceptions. So before I say this, there are exceptions. Um, but it is an illusion to the gamer that you can join in and play at the same level or enjoy the game at the same pace uh, as other people when you get in there. Little do you know, or little do most people know when they get in, that as soon as they see all the trailers, they get excited, they join the game, play their first couple of matches, that not one or two hours into the game, they're going to get killed by somebody that paid money to get ahead of them. And that is the inherent flaw in free-to-play models. And is an illusion of being able to play on the same level, of the same competition, um, as same level of competition as anybody that is paying money. Um, it, it's 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 just basically uh, an unbalanced time investment. It it goes back to what I said, where you you can get into the game and you can level up and and starting on a clean slate with everybody is great and you feel like you're working with everybody, you're having a good time. But and you'll never hear it advertised. But that one guy that's paying money, you're you're wondering like, how is he getting so so much cool things that I'm not getting? Well, suddenly it's not a free-to-play game there anymore because you know in order to compete, you're going to have to pay money. And um, Well, let's throw a devil's advocate here. If you treat free-to-play games as if they were a demo, and then if you decide to pay to get the quote-unquote real game, is that okay? Because no, once you pay, they, you get the if real they game? they advertise that as such. Yeah. But ah, they say, it's they the say obfuscation songs. that's a problem. Yes. Yeah. It's dishonest to say free to play is if you're never going to have to. It's pay not. For it. It's not honest. The developers that set up that kind of system are not honest to the gamers. That, that's what it comes down to. They they will present their game in a fashion that says, uh, and Korean MMOs are famous for this. Okay, mm-hmm. and that's why they have the stigma they do. But they will show trailers. Oh, you can do everything. You can do everything you want in the game, et cetera, et cetera. But it isn't until you get into the game that, and after you play and start liking some of the gameplay mechanics assuming it's a good game that you realize it's you can't you know do the best you can without paying and that's dishonest now if a game developer up front said you know you're going to be leveling slower or you know there's there's going to be stages where you might have to pay money in order to advance further that'd be a whole different thing but they don't design the games like that they they try to max that as much as possible and they fill all their advertisements with you can do everything it's free to play so it yep. sounds like what you're saying is there's two different types of free to play games there's the ones that give you uh, full equipment to be able to stand toe to toe with everybody the instant you start and then they charge you for options and there's the free-to-play games that start you with the crippled version of the thing that you're going to be and then tell you it's going to take you weeks to get there or here pay to get, to bypass that is that sort of the the thing that we're talking about here yeah and speaking of yeah speaking of the korean mmos uh neko and and chat there said it perfectly um what made it so famous, Korean MMOs, is that they are cash grabs, like he's saying. They are typically, with free-to-play models, they have a stigma that any intelligent gamer knows that you're not going to be able to get into this game and play it long-term. I've never seen a free-to-play game, or let's say an MMO, free-to-play MMO, last any extensive amount of time. And any MMO that went free-to-play did it with, on their deathbed. Mm-hmm. And it's just a last-ditch effort to get as much money as possible in the shortest amount of time before they call it kaput. Um, now, that's the case with MMOs. Now, we've seen other games, like I said, there are exceptions like League and stuff that have you know, gone out. But that gets back to where I said where in League, there's no real – I mean, there's some minor boosters, but there's no real way to set yourself apart from another player um, with a special weapon you know, or a special item or anything like that. They don't have that. If uh, if they went into League and, and added a new top-tier item that you can only get if you were subscribing, that would be crossing that line. 
And unfortunately, thankfully, they haven't done anything like that. They know exactly to leave it at skins, uh, cosmetic stuff, you know, et cetera, like that. Yeah, I, I can see the line being drawn. I'll get to you in a second, too, Brett, but I can definitely see the line being drawn between games like League of Legends, Team Fortress 2, uh, Tribes Ascend. Those ones come to mind where they give you a fully kitted class or champion, what have you, where if you play that specific class that you're given because it's the free week or what have you, um, then you can stand toe to toe with other people in the role that class or champion is designed for. However, you're not going to be as versatile and able to change to another class or another champion with a different role or have a different weapon loadout that allows you to play differently. It's basically like we're going to give you one complete play style where you are not gimped at all in that one play style. And then these other games like Star Conflict, World of Tanks, that basically say, here's a crippled version of what you're eventually going to be. That's where you start. You don't, you can't start with a fully competitive version of the tier, highest tier thing. And those are two very different types of free-to-play models. And I definitely like the one when I don't like the other. All right, to Brad, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that somebody in the chat mentioned that uh, comparing the free-to-play application for MMOs and MOBAs might be apples to oranges a little bit because mm. of the way that progression is set up in that game. And I think there's certainly a point to be made for certain game formats may be much better suited to free-to-play than other game formats. That's true. That's like, true. Mo MOBA seem to lend themselves especially well to it because every character is going to have a specific kit and there's no reason to make somebody pay, you know, unless you're a complete asshole to, you know, we'll give you the Q for free, but W, E, and R are going to cost you. <laughs> That's actually the way that I compared, like, everybody always points to League of Legends, like, the success story of free-to-play games, right? It was the first massive success, um, well, it's, it's well aside from Farmville, but, yeah, exactly. It has a lot of features that make it work really well with that business model. Lots of business models don't work with lots of types of games, and free-to-play doesn't always work with a particular type of game. But one of the things that I always pointed out when I was talking about Planet Side 2 is you start with a character that doesn't seem like like you said it's as if you give like the the Q and the W but here you can't have your E and R until you either rank yeah. up or pay and that ugh, that and feeling of incompleteness from the very beginning is what bugs me and it works the opposite too because what do we all think immediately when we find out that a player that killed us has all of the buy, you know the buy to wins type stuff you know what what goes through your head admit it okay you're like I'm better than that guy. I'm better than that guy. <laughs> if I had the money, I'd be smashing his face in. You know, we all think that, you know. And that's that's another awful stigma that free-to-play games, I think, create. Because uh, that you know, like, if you, get, if you lose to a certain player, it's not a matter of you trying to evaluate your skill versus theirs. It's not a matter of you trying to look over your replays or look over your stream or whatever and see what can I do to be better next time or to better you know approach this this type of gameplay next time you don't do that with free to play games typically if you lose to that guy you're gonna immediately sum up the equipment you have that you that you worked and basically earned over time versus the equipment he has that's premium and that it's almost sickeningly the way they want you to think the developers it's like Okay, that guy with the premium sniper rifle just killed me. Now, if I want to snipe and I want to out-snipe him, you're not thinking about tactics or what you can do to kill him. You're thinking, I need that rifle. And you would hope, you would hope that people well, would notice that and say, ah, I see what you're doing, developer. I'm not going to fall for your <laughs> trick. But no, it turns out that there are vast majorities of people out there that don't care and they'll just pay for power. They don't care that it's that it's ruining the game design. They just say, I want to be better than that guy, and that's more important than sleazy, you know, development techniques. Well, I, I certainly see things like that and say, well, it's time for me to put this game the fuck down. <laughs> and so the good news is that more people are getting that same attitude to Brett. And I'd like to quickly go to an article I found on Gamma Sutra called Systems of Control in Free-to-Play Games. And this actually came out uh, two, three days ago, 
So it's very apt, and I did not know that this came out three days ago until I started looking up stuff. Uh, so what he basically goes on to talk about is there's uh, two different pieces of control when it comes to things like free-to-play games. There's visibility of control. That's how obvious it is to the player that they're being controlled and convinced that they need to spend money on something rather than just you know having a good design and having that sell the game itself. And then there's tolerance to control. How much control a participant can tolerate or even crave represents their tolerance to control. He basically says people like having some limits placed on them because it gives them the ability to um, to really come up and be creative. I mean, for example, when you go up to somebody and you say, think of a woman, give me a woman's name. And somebody's like, okay, Martha. But if you say, give me a name, then it'll take people longer because there's less limits. They don't, they, because if you have limits, that would, anyways, that I'm getting too far off the string. The, the point is, if the visibility of control is lower than the tolerance to control, then the person is willing to proceed. But if the visibility, if it's obvious that you're being controlled, is higher, then people reject it. Now, what this means in free-to-play games is that if, imagine in the old days a game, a consumer would go from A to D. They'd buy the game for $60, they'd get the game. In free-to-play games, what they do is you go from A to B, which is the free part, then you go from B to C for $1, and then they get you from C to D for $500, which is exactly the, the PlanetSide 2 model, because that game costs $700 if you buy everything in it, <laughs> which is absurd. And that's not including the cosmetic stuff. That's what bugged the hell out of me. <laughs> but anyway, what he then goes to say is that in the Western uh, world, we have a much lower tolerance to control. We much have our resting TTC rate is much lower. In, uh, in Asia, it's much higher. They have a much higher TTC, which is why those free to play milk, milk you for tons of money while you grind games are so popular there. But he says that what these companies are doing is essentially tricking the consumers into paying much more than the value of the product they are receiving. Think of the people who pay hundreds of dollars for Farmville in order to be able to click on plants more. I mean, maybe they're getting something out of that, but in comparison to other high quality games, the value of those games just seems to me like they're lower. So what this author calls it is when you're basically con convincing a player something has a higher value than it actually does and convincing them to, to pay for it using psychological trickery, he calls that coercive free-to-play. Now what he says later in this article is that according to the metrics, people's tolerance to control is going lower and lower as a result of this coercive model being used. And he compares it to antibiotics in that you know, when you use antibiotics on a bug, then you only make it stronger and more resistant to the antibiotics. As people use these cash grab free to play models, people become more resistant and they will be less likely to be tricked into doing it again. Uh, so he says right here, the end result of this business strategy is the extinction of coercive free to play. I hope that that is true. So... So Take that I, with a grain of salt. Because <laughs> if if anybody pays two hundred dollars for the ultimate pack in Marvel Heroes, I'm gonna. Oh my God! Let's bring I'm that gonna, up. I'm let's pull this up on the screen for all, you. Yeah, because because all I was thinking of while you were saying this was, as far as something not being worth the value that they're asking for it. So there's a there's a free to play. I guess it's it's a cooperative battle or arena type of thing where you and Three other friends are dropped into an area. You play Marvel superheroes, and you cooperatively beat the hell out of robots. And this is something I should have been all about. Yep, absolutely. Like this, this cooperative play, comic books. This matches up with all of my interests. But if you want the ultimate pack of the game, which gives you all of the heroes and costumes and whatnot, they believe this is a value worth $200. And they're not even selling it to you piecemeal so that you don't know it's worth $200. They're just saying, <laughs> like, they're, they're putting it right out on the fucking table. <laughs> this is $200. Let's this look at what you get. For this $200, you get all the heroes and costumes available to purchase at launch. Three exclusive costumes, an exclusive enhanced costume, $50 of in-game currency, because after you've purchased the game for $200, <laughs> you still need to purchase yeah. more so things in the game. So it's $150 then. <laughs> if, 
<laughs> if fifty dollars of in-game currency is in there, chop that right off the top first of all. <laughs> You're also paying for early game access and close because apparently those are different. You get permanent account level five percent XP boost because oh, this is what gets me every time. With these kinds of games where they sell you boosts, when they sell you boosts, they are acknowledging that they know the game is not as fun and that you are going to want to skip it. I want to skip this and I'm going to pay you to help me skip it to get to the good part. <laughs> and they're acknowledging that right there by selling you a boost. They said, we understand that you don't like the this and that you part. don't want to play it. The best part is the True Believer title. <laughs> oh, yeah. You get a forum title. True Believer. So that everyone can know how much of a sucker you are to <laughs> see any of your opinions that you post on that forum. <laughs> True Believer is so ironic because that's what the name you use for people who are, like, so far gone into believing in a cult or some, like, well, completely it, loony it, it, thing. This in this case, it's a Stan Lee thing. Stan Lee will refer to comic book fans as true, but it's a term of... I, I know. That's, that's why it's ironic, because they're using it very full-facedly. They're, they're taking one of my favorite people and making him strangely Orwellian, and I don't... <laughs> wow. Oh, by the way, this $200 also gets you listed in the Marvel Heroes game credits. Yeah. What? That's another... See, see I see this on Kickstarter sometime as well. I, I don't get it. <laughs> don't, nothing. That reminds me. What? Remember? I don't remember if you were there, to Brett, but we watched all three of the Lord of the Rings yes, extended there. editions. There were 19 minutes of credits on those movies, and the last 10 minutes was all the listing of every single person in the Lord of the Rings fan club. We'd like to thank everyone in the Lord of the Rings fan club. 10 minutes of full wall-to-wall -wall text of people's names scrolling constantly because apparently those people all had something to do with the movie being created. I'm not sure. All right. Anyway, as funny as that was, let's get back to um, our discussion here. Uh, so the point of those articles was that the game purposefully frustrates you and purposefully adjusts the pacing or limits your versatility of the things you would like to have and be versatile for. Um, but I think there's another pitfall to free-to-play games, and it's not an obvious one, and it's not nearly as nefarious as the other ones that we're talking about. Even in games where people aren't trying to be milked out of their money, if they're giving a valuable service and people are willing to pay for the value they find, even if Planetside 2 had a decent pricing structure. The problem with the free-to-play model is that it encourages so much new content and so much new stuff that it eventually creates a super complex game. I mean, even right now, um, League of Legends is, is luckily sort of bounded by the fact that you can only have 10 champions in a match, but I mean, in Planetside 2, you're open to every upgrade ever could be in a battle with 50 on 50 people. Every one of those 50 people could have a different upgrade and a different slot and a different thing. And what that winds up doing is it dilutes the rules of the game. For example, there's an upgrade that allows you to get special shoes to make it so that you run silently. Okay, that breaks the rule of if I'm standing still, I expect to hear someone coming up behind me. That's just one example. But if there's every month you get more and more of these exceptions that break game rules, eventually the rules are meaningless because you can't rely on any of them to be static anymore. If somebody can fly through the air and hover there forever instead of having to, you know, have the recharge or whatever because of some upgrade, well, that breaks a huge rule. So that is, I think, a massive problem in these free-to-play models is that it the, encourages you, same like Magic the Gathering has to keep putting out expansions, eventually you're going to run out of good ideas and you're going to ruin the game by putting crappier and crappier ideas onto cards. The same thing can happen in free-to-play games. Yeah, for the most part. Um, I I now, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was just going to insult Bridger for a second. Oh, no, by, by all means. <laughs> <laughs> by all means, let me get my barbie quick. I was going to say, I had something to say to that, then I got really lost in your logic for the magic card one because I don't think that's how it works. But anyway... 
I never thought I would be defending magic, and you're making me do it. And I do. <laughs> That's not true. That is how you do it. They have to reboot the whole system every couple of generations because they've gone so convoluted and there's so many cards that you can't keep the damn thing straight. No, but that's not how the tournament scene works. In the tournament scene, there's a certain number of sets that come out every X number of years, and only the past Y sets are valid in tournament. Yeah, but that doesn't change the fact that you're going to run out of good ideas. No, but they're, it, it, it's bad for not the reason you're saying. It's bad because <laughs> you're extorting people to keep paying for oh, more okay. cards so that they can keep playing tournament style, which is what they enjoy. It's not that there are bad ideas being put into cards. And Oku says the big benefit of free-to-play, and I guess that's when we didn't cover, is it creates a ton of players. You can have a huge player base with free-to-play. We kind of covered that with Barrier to Entry, but the result of a large player base is you can do more things that you couldn't do with a pay game, for example. If you have a game that came out, like um, a perfect example, what was the name of Space Dota? Do you remember the name of that game? There was a game that basically was was a Defense of the Ancients or a MOBA game in space. And it was a for-pay game, and it tanked because there was so few people in the community that when new people went to play the game, they said, oh, there's nobody playing this, and they left. So they wouldn't buy the game. Uh, so that is a benefit. I won't uh, ignore that as a benefit. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that certainly has its advantages. Uh, stellar Impact. Stellar Impact. Thank you. Thank you, Nico Fest. That's the game I'm referring to. It was really cool. I enjoyed the hell out of that game, but the community just dwindled up and died because it was getting no new people in it. Uh, and that was sort of in a beta stage, too. So people played it and moved on, and no new people came to play because it, uh, it, was, it, was, it was pay to play. And I think it's still available on Steam, but I don't think that anybody is playing it anymore. Um, okay, so <clears throat> where do we go from here? Um, I don't know. This isn't where I intended to be. Uh, so, uh, what about... We kind of covered pay to win, but what's the line that you would draw? I mean, a lot of people play World of Tanks, and a lot of people don't care that they can shoot money out of their tank that does more damage. <laughs> the, the line in the sand that I draw is if I ever feel that the fun that I'm getting from the game is less than the amount of time I have to spend in order to get more fun. So the pacing the, has to be right. The pacing has to be right. In Tribes, I was having a little bit of fun with the game, and then I looked ahead to see what things in the future I could be having fun with, and then I weighed the time I had to spend to get that fun versus the, time, the dwindling amount of fun I had leading up to getting the new thing to have fun with. Yep. It's kind of the same thing in, like I said, that gave the perfect example of Half-Life. You get a crowbar, then a pistol, then you get new toys yeah. to play with as you go. Exactly. In an MMO, you get new abilities to play with as you level up. If the pacing is wrong and you're bored with the abilities you have before you get a new thing to play with, then the game drives people away. Yes. And, and Tribes wasn't necessarily the best example of this, but you know, I think Planet Side 2 is a much worse example. But uh, Nico oh, Fest and, is making um, the same. It, hang on, Nico Fest is making the same defense of World of Tanks that I've seen everybody else make. Well, gold ammo is nice, but only really skilled players can take advantage of it. Oh, so it's only pay to win in the in the hand of skilled players. That makes it okay. I don't know. I stopped playing that game as soon as I fi fi you figured out that you could shoot but, money uh, out of your tank. So the <laughs> the other line. <laughs> The, the other line that I draw is anything where I can only play the game a certain amount and then the game says you can't play me anymore until you give me money. Like, I would like to be able to determine how much of a game I can play, even if it's free to play. <laughs> so, like, Spiral Knights got disqualified for that reason because I would play with friends and then I would go, I have this energy and I, it got, it's gone after we went to this dungeon. Where did I spend it? And they said, oh, you spent it on getting into the dungeon. <laughs> we can only do, you know, and they, in my, I had friends who played Spiral Knights, and they would, they would slot their playing time around the nightly reset, so they could play for as long as possible in a row. They would say, we have to start at 9, so that by 11 we've spent all our stuff, so that we can keep playing after 11, <laughs> because that's when the things reset. And I said, I'm out of here. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's one of the, the, the free-to-play models that comes over from, uh, like, the Farmville Zynga games. That whole concept of, you know, you only have X many actions or so much energy, and you should go recruit other players, and we'll give you more energy. It's a pyramid scheme is what it is. <laughs> oh, man, it's... I think I would put my line very simply, Bridger, at if it's anything but cosmetic or anything but aesthetic... It's pay to win. Mm -hmm. It because it, it, I don't I, I do not accept the argument of, well, if you play twenty hours more than this guy, then you'll be on the same level as him. I, I don't buy that for a second. I I'm stuck on the idea that if I play at the similar skill level as somebody else, I should be relatively at the same point of the game as they will be, and have access to the same things as they will be. So you uh, you would say even tribes. Uh, with its, okay, we're going to give you a light class, a medium class, and a heavy class, and they're all effective in combat, they're not underpowered, uh, but you don't have access to these other nine classes. The fact that other people who paid to get to those classes faster, that would be pay to win in your book? I'm not playing tribes anymore, am I? Ah, uh, well, that gets to the point of, is versatility a kind of power? And that's, it, I agree with you there. I'll give you an example of how tribes could have done it. You know, they could have unlocked all the classes from the start. They could have removed the boosters and given given everybody basic weapons. And then, as you unlock more powerful weapons at the same rate as everybody else, you could buy special skins for them. If you want your sniper to look like an AWP, you can buy a skin for it. But Performance-wise, and the way it plays, and the skill required to use it would be across the be the exact same across the board, whether you're paying or you're not paying. That that is the in my in my instance anything but that is pay to win, and that's just kind of the the way I uh, sit on those things. Yeah, I I tend to agree because I I'm, and I made the same argument in Planet Side Two and in Tribes is that versatility is a kind of power. If I have the ability to switch to another class that is more effective for a given situation, that is a kind of power. And they're, they're, so that's a sort of paying to win right there, just having access to that other piece of material. I do really appreciate that Tribes just came out and said, you can buy the game and play it as if it was a pay-to-play game instead of a free-to-play game. Um, I think that really made me want to go and play Tribes again, honestly. Uh, but the problem with what you're talking about, Freelancer, is from a business perspective... I think the skin selling, the cosmetics, only works in certain types of games. I think it works in League of Legends because everybody has the same view, guaranteed. They're going to be looking down at your champions. You can see your champion. That's another big important thing. You have to be able to enjoy your own skin. And so when it's third person, you can do that. And when other people can see it at the same way that you can see it, that works. In Planet Side, when the only time that you see your skin is when you die... Or the only time you see somebody else's skin is when they shoot you from 200 meters away and then on the death screen it shows their laughing skull. That doesn't work very well. Nobody wants to pay for it. I, I have no I, I incentive. I completely disagree, and I'll just say one game title for you that proves it entirely the opposite. Team Fortress 2. Fucking hats! No! <laughs> I hate Team that! Team Fortress 2. Well, you just explained... It was exactly, much closer up in TF2, though. Exactly. You can actually see Team the annoying hats. 2, yes. And they are making... Boatloads of money, Bridger. Well, and I would argue, like he said, see, they're closer. The only time you see it is when they kill you or if they're 200 meters away, quote-unquote. No, so, no. When you taunt over <laughs> someone's corpse, you can see the funny hat that you're taunting them with. I hate the hats, though. I want to click something to make uh, the hats not viewable to me only. Like, let everybody else see the hats. I like the characters the way they used to look. The soldier's not the soldier unless he has his helmet down to here. And yes, I know the chat room saying originally didn't launch as such, but they saw the opportunity to switch it to a free-to-play. And even now that it's free-to-play, it's still making more money than most launches in the last year have made in in the similar instance. It's Even today... They are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on just hats, and they are Why loving. Why are people paying for hats? I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but I don't care if they're paying for hats as long as the hats don't give a mechanical advantage. The problem is they have some hats that give mechanical advantages when they complete a set, and that brr, makes me angry. <laughs> Grinds yeah, my gears. It is one of the reasons I fell out with TF2 is I didn't like some of the things that they added. 
I stopped playing it. I mean, I'd go back and play it just for but, fun, uh, too, but it, it still it still bugs me. Um, so is then... Uh, what, so what? so so pale assassin said something in the chat that I want to address where he was uh I guess pointing out a possible hypocrisy on our point saying that lol was fine even though that you can pay for IP boost to get IP faster. But I I feel like that's not necessarily a benefit because the amount of time that it takes for you to master a champion through playing games is roughly equivalent to the amount of time you need to buy a new champ. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably about right. Uh, the and pacing because, in that game is probably yes. well done to the point. Yes, and because there's a rotating free week of champions, there's never a shortage of things to choose from if you just want to go and try something new. So, <laughs> let me see. What else do I have on here? <laughs> I was just going to ask a question. It was very important, and now I can't remember what it was. Um, so, Freelancer, then, aside from League of Legends, what games out there would you consider that aren't pay-to-win? What, from this big list that we've got here, isn't a pay-to-win game? Not a single one. So, for League of Legends is the only one that does it right? No, they don't do it right. They I don't do it right either. League of Legends <laughs> does it right. Wait, but how? I mean, the only thing that gives an in-game advantage is stuff that you can only purchase with currency from playing the game. Well, all right, if we're talking about pay to win, then yeah, you're right. Okay, that's what and, I was talking. I was referring back yeah. to your pay to win argument. But um, even then, it's two people starting at the same level in League of Legends, there is still the element, although not as pronounced as other games like, you know, Planet Side and such, it is still there where runes and the addition of runes and so two two friends, one that has a bunch of expendable expendable income and one that doesn't get into game and then they end up getting versed against each other a week later that person that used money to get ahead will have a rune page that the rune page alone will near outclass the other player in mid uh, or anywhere else for that ex for that case um, and that is present you can't deny that the good now, news there is you that could it argue, plateaus fairly quickly that's right? what I was going to say you could argue and this is what League of Legends does right that it plateaus very quickly right after, let's say, three weeks, Bridger, or let's say four weeks, both players you know, are going to be relatively on the same level. No, no issue there. But it's still, for anybody that dedicates their time to it, if you decide to branch out to other classes, which eventually you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to learn how to play jungle, you're going to have to learn how to do this and that, you have to buy more runes or you have to be able to get more runes, and those boosts allow, again, that player, that buddy that has expendable income to immediately acquire what he needs for those uh, particular roles. And so you can't say it's not there, but it is done far better in League of Legends than Tribes that's, Ascend, where I immediately get point. killed. Where in Planet Side, <laughs> Bridger, <laughs> where I'm piloting um, anyone, let's say a Mosquito, right? And I don't have my rockets and stuff yet. Well, let me tell you something. You're not a pilot unless you have your rockets. No, you're not. That's the first <laughs> thing I wound up buying. I, I, I really, really wanted Planet Side 2 to be awesome. And I fucking fell for it. And ugh. Yeah, so, I mean, that's what I'm kind of getting at. There, there is there's a, and definitely a gray area. There's no saying that this game is a complete failure. There's no saying this game is completely pay to win. There are games that do it far, far better and, and hide it a lot better. Uh, TF2 and League of Legends focus more on the aesthetic side of things. When a new champion comes out, you can immediately buy the champion if you've played, let's say, 10 games You know, in the last week. You'll, you'll have, well, probably a little more than that, but most people do in one week. Uh, you'll have enough of the, the in-game credit to be able to just plain out buy that champion. But they immediately offer it with a fancy skin, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know and you could, you could, you can do all that and, you know, get a fancy new legendary skin or whatever it might be. And that's what they try to make mo the most money off of. And people buy into that. And that's okay. In my eyes, the idea of buying a hat and when, when team fortress two hats first came out and the custom skins first came out, they didn't have little attributes added to them. When hats first came out and they were immensely popular in team fortress two, they were just aesthetic. If you wanted an alligator head, okay, you have an alligator head. But they started adding stats to them and stuff, and that's kind of where it went to that gray area again. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what about the thing that really can make me angry is that it, it seems like all developers, what they'll try to do is they'll try to 
force you to buy things that you don't want, don't need. Just like there's 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 things you can buy in these free to play games that are just valueless. They're useless. They're worthless. They're things you shouldn't buy. Perfect example. People told me when I first started playing League of Legends, don't spend any of your IP oh, on yeah. runes in the t first tier. Don't spend any of your IP on runes until you get to, to level 20. And I was like, what are you talking about? Why should I do that? Because they're a crappy buy. You buy them, and even though they're cheap, they're going to last you for like 5, 10 levels, and then you're going to be never using them again, and they're going to be cluttering up your menu, and you're not going to get a big enough benefit in those few levels that it's going to matter, and now you're going to slow yourself down to getting the permanent runes you're going to get later. Another example, in Star Conflict, you get the same exact thing. You've got Tier 1 ships, and they give you the option to pimp out your Tier 1 ships to replace your normal weapons with weapons that have an extra 2% DPS. Weapons that you will never use again once you get out of Tier 1, unless maybe you go to another Empire Tier 1 later on. But it's just slowing down your progression to getting to the end. It's an artificial junk trap trying to convince people to slow their own progression down and buy something that is going to be useless within a few short play sessions. Oh, that bugs me so much, and it seems to... I don't know why so many of them do it. It's just it, They all do it. Ah! <laughs> yeah, ru runes are definitely the Achilles heel of League of Legends, as far as its model goes. I wouldn't be surprised if before long we'll see those Tier 1, Tier 2 runes just go away completely. I mean, they, they're they not... I mean, well, they are different from the Tier 3, but um, I, I just don't see the the benefit. I mean, the common knowledge and everybody that has any friends playing League, those friends will immediately, if they're true friends, will immediately say, don't buy runes. Uh, don't buy those friend, tier one runes, you know. Friends don't let and, friends buy runes. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and they'll, they'll say it. I mean, I, and I think that's, I think it's an archaic idea to have tier one, tier two runes. Nobody buys them anymore unless you don't have any friends. And they don't, <laughs> and they a, don't, and they don't warn you. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised, I mean, mark my words, if by, before the end of this year, that you won't see tier one, tier two runes go right go away completely um they just everybody knows not to get them and they just seem just there you know and nobody really buys them or uses them there are i think plenty of cosmetic or aesthetic things that are missed uh in these kinds of games like i mean the perfect example actually in hawken you can buy special taunts for your mech so that when you like kill somebody you can do some kind of a funky chicken dance that they couldn't do. I mean, that's a cool, fun, non-gameplay affecting thing. I wish more games would lean more heavily on the non-mechanical cosmetic type aspects than the mechanical ones. Uh, but it does seem like they're, 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 there's, like we said, that split between things like Team Fortress 2 and, and Tribes and League of Legends and the games that really want you to have that progression-like reward dopamine kick every X minutes. And, uh, I mean, the other thing that these articles said is that you should just specifically, when you're designing your game, make sure that they get lots of cool rewards and unlocks within the first, you know, like, few hours of play. But after that, it should ramp up exponentially so the next, you know, thing is just way further away. <sighs> anyway, uh, let's see. Any, any final words here? Are there any kinds of games that can't be made free-to-play? Because there have certainly been genres that... You know, are we ever going to see, like, a Total War free-to-play version? I think it's... God. M M MMOs, I don't think, are... Uh, I have seen no evidence that there's a good model for it. Hmm. I don't play enough of the free-to-play MMOs to dispute that, but it seems like some of them are still going. The fact that there are RPG elements and you can pay to skip over the RPG elements of leveling up a character is... A, a def, uh, it's a definite flaw, and I think until there's a new strategy that doesn't involve hang to level up faster or getting shinier items that will allow you to hit harder and give you an artificial benefit, I don't know. Well, I think didn't didn't I don't remember if it was which one it was, but I thought it was Lord of the Rings Online that gave you the full experience but limited the number of class options you had or the race options you had, something to that effect. Yeah, but they make that very clear, you know, in Lord in, in Lord of the Rings Online that, 
right from the get-go, you're not going to be able to get past this certain level, you know, or get past this certain gate gated content. When it first came out, Minds of Moria, I was I was a big Lotro player myself. Oh, okay. um, when that model was announced, it was very clearly said that you're not going to be able to get past Minds of Moria without paying for the game, okay, huh. or at least subscribing to the game. Um, and there was also a certain level cap too. I don't remember because I had already paid for the game and stuff, but. They made it very clear. It was very pronounced and very, you know, you're not getting past this part without paying. Up until this point, enjoy the entirety of the game. They didn't limit you. They didn't offer, you know, anything that, uh, or they didn't, you know, d let's say they, they didn't give you a lack of classes or anything like that. You could do whatever you want, play the game like normal up until this point. But it's very clear that once you reach this point, you know, you need to access further. You need to buy this or subscribe. Okay, so I guess before we go, uh, why don't we quickly mention some of the free-to-play games that we have enjoyed the most and why? Uh, you know, like a top three list or something like that. Uh, do you have any... I think we can probably all agree that League of Legends is on that list since we've all been sort of talking about it in shining examples throughout the entire show. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, well, League of Legends... Star Conflict, which is one that we're playing more recently, which is really good. Um, it, so, do you, you you enjoy that for its gameplay, not for its uh, business model? I assume because it's not like I think the scaling in Star Conflict is very straightforward. Like we're playing right now on Team Legacy with a bunch of people doing Star Conflict. I'm one of very few that has bought a few of the custom things with real money, but there's not a chance in heck that I'll be able to go up against certain other individuals in Team Legacy, you know, because I have this ship or this ship. Because it, it very basically, or it's very simply based on skill. There's no special weapon that I bought that he can't get. There's no special ship that I bought that he can't get an equivalent of. And it's not hard for him to get to any certain point that I might be at. Um and so that's, that comes down to that gray area where I think they're doing it right. And that's why the game seems to be doing okay. It's still in, in beta, and there's still a lot of balance issues. But there's, there's no one arguing that it's pay to win in Star Conflict. There's a lot of people arguing that this ship's overpowered or this ship's overpowered. But you don't hear it like this premium ship is overpowered. You don't hear that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's where they're doing it right. Now, they have a lot of bugs to fix and such, but... That's that's regardless. Okay, Rob, any any ones that jump out on you? Uh, I know you were a big Team Fortress Two fan, but not so much anymore. No, I would actually say that I stopped liking that game once it became free to play. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, any any other well, free to play games besides League that that jump out? Uh, no, I think I've dropped almost every free to play game I've ever picked up within a week of starting to play it because of that frustrating nature of it or the pay to win aspect yeah i mean i guess i i going back to the article i'm overly sensitive to feeling like a game is trying to control me mm. so fair enough fair enough i i have a very low threshold for for throwing that back at a game and just not playing it i still enjoy the hell out of team fortress 2 we've been playing team fortress 2 like tf2 nights in team legacy where we all just jump onto a server i think we, we still have our own server right free uh, yep. We have our own TF2 sure server. Uh, so for those of you not in, in the Team Legacy community, it's as simple as signing up on the forum, hanging out in our team speak, and playing with us. There's uh, no no requirement to be a community member other than don't be a dick and just hang out <laughs> and play. That's pretty much the rules. And uh, you know, the thing about Team Fortress 2 is that everybody that's joined us, we get all sorts of new people every time um, when we do these nights, is that it's an example of it sort of being done right where if you just download the game and play – you can sort of pick your niche. If you want to be a medic, you can be an effective medic. You know, it's um, it, it does that. Oh yeah, right. no, I, I, I think in that setting, I would, I would still really enjoy Team Fortress Two. But going on to, uh, hopping onto a server, not knowing what all of these reskinned versions of items that already exist, and there's oh, yeah, seven yeah. spy knives, and there's you can't, you can't play soldier. it competitively, is what you're saying, you, because you, yeah, you just have to treat it like a casual game. That's what really got me into TF2 was uh, I think the perfect balance moment in TF2 was when every class had two options for all the slots. Mm -hmm. Like right, I wish I could have frozen TF2 right when everybody had those 
that equal number of choices. Just and like the main loadout the... and that achievement loadout that they were able to get. Those two and yes. nothing else. And I, I really like the, the achievement system for unlocking those items as well, where just by playing a class that you like, you would get more things for it. Another game I don't see on our list here um, is one that's more recently been launched that we have a lot of people playing, which is Neverwinter, um, the MMO. Um, I haven't played it at all, but I can say that from all the other TL members that are playing it, it very it very much appears like you can get into there, you can level up, you can do PvP and such, and you won't. It's not really the pay to win. Like if you go into an arena, it's going to be based on the way you play your character versus the way they play their character, whether they're buying extra boosters or what have you, what whatever's available. So I just figured, you know, we throw it on there and let it to all of our listeners know that that is more recently launched as far as an MMO that seems to be doing the right thing with it. Um, and, of course, there's bugs and stuff as well, but it seems to be a pretty solid option. You know, if you don't have money right now and you're you're looking at all these games, we don't have a single MMO on this list. Well, Neverwinter may be just your thing. And it sounds like what you guys are both saying is that if you play these games in sort of a casual um, you know, environment just to have fun with people, not in a competitive sense, then it can still be very enjoyable, even if the pacing is off, even if it's frustrating that you can't get to what you want, even if you don't have the versatility that you want, um, you know, that, that it can still be a very enjoyable experience despite all that, as long as you have somebody to share it with. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I'd say that's, I'd say that's definitely fair. Unfortunately, so many of these games are designed to be competitive. Yeah, that's the other thing, is even Planetside 2 says they want to be an eSport, and I really don't know how that's ever going to happen. But uh, a lot of them are specifically designing competitive modes, like MechWarrior Online is trying to have clan versus clan matches. Hawken is doing the same thing. Uh, you know, Star Conflict already has a clan system built in. I can't imagine they wouldn't launch some kind of clan versus clan matchup system. Um, and the problem that I see there every time is how are you going to guarantee a competitive spirit in which everybody has fair access to all of these options when the only person who can do that is somebody who's grinded through all the different options like in mech warrior online unless you have mechs that can fill every single role for your team that's going to be a problem but i don't know maybe it'll shake up like league of legend does and you'll have people specialize in being an ap mid or a jungle or what have you and so people will just buy the few mechs that fit their niche and they'll get together with other people that complement them and they'll create, you know, the clans of mechs and stuff like that. So we'll see how that all shakes down. A lot of the games on this list are still technically in beta. MechWarrior Online, League of Legends, Star Conflict, War Thunder, uh, Super Monday Night Combat I think is not quite launched, but it might, might have launched recently. Firefall, Warframe is still in beta, Dota is still in beta. That'll probably be perpetually in beta because it's a Valve game. Um, End of Nations is still in beta. A lot of these are still in beta technically. They all launched months ago. But they're still in beta, and that's one of the beta, things that I think, happens. On a side note, I think a lot of these games in beta is an excuse for their problems. Well, there's uh, that, but they're I'm also saying, feature you know, incomplete. They're missing things that yeah, should be in the game. But a the lot of these games, you and I both know, pretty much have their full fl slew of features. And they're still in beta because of balance issues, or they're still in beta because of this. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But we'll you're see. right about the, the Dota 2 thing. It's, it's like TF2, it's going to be in beta forever and ever before it's ever officially released. So. Yeah, it's yeah, like I mean, any Google I think, product. I was about to say, Google had a big, big hand in changing what beta means because I think Gmail is still in beta. <laughs> no, it's not, but you can go into Google Labs and enable a special button that will bring make the beta it, back. That could bring the beta back so that it will be beta again, uh, which is. <laughs> kind of interesting that i'm i'm serious i'm dead serious you can go into there and add beta to the logo that's one of the google labs options in gmail uh so all right i think we covered a lot of stuff uh we're at about 90 minutes here so i think we're going to call it uh what i would like to do is that a lot of these games are solid really fun games mech warrior online i've played hawken i've played team fortress 2 i've played i've played star conflict war thunder tribes ascent super monday night conflict all of these are easy to jump into, and I would like to try and have like, uh, you know, like 
free to play Fridays or something where we would just like pick a new free to play game and say this is the game we're playing for this week and then maybe vote after we've played them all like what should we play next week well most people really like talking so let's try to play around with that uh, and and we'll do some fun streaming stuff I don't know I think I think we've been playing a lot of Star Conflict maybe a couple weeks from now we'll pick something else I don't know it'll be a lot of fun but in the interim I am Bridger signing off thank you guys for joining me that would be you guys now, yes, I have been tippered. I'm just thinking, you know, we have to do a show about subscription versus buy to play now, right? Ooh. Like we just have to, because that's that's like a moral dilemma in in our community. I'm sure in very many others. You know what? We free to play is a big topic, but I think we could throw another show together about all of the other types of funding: crowdfunding versus subscription versus buy to play. Uh, because those have a lot of interesting discussions going on. Free to play just happens to be the emerging market where we've got all these examples to talk about. But the other ones have been around for a while. Crowdfunding about the is only exception. So uh, if you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to the Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Bridger15. If you enjoyed watching this on the uh, on the YouTube, you can find that at uh, youtube.com slash sound strategy network. And uh, join the Team Legacy community for a lot of fun playing a lot of the games that we talked about specifically League of Legends on Saturdays where we get about 40 people showing up for giant matches uh, but also throughout the week we play all kinds of other games as he mentioned Neverwinter we've got Wildstar coming up that everybody's excited for Star Citizen way down the road ESO way down the road so join us teamlegacy.net I am Bridger this is Freelancer and to Brett thank you guys for joining me have a good night see you guys Forgot to change over the other logo, and if and if anybody um, enjoys Return to Castle Wolfenstein, I will recommend another Twitch channel for you, and that's Warwitch TV. Before I sign out, I just want to say subscription best model. Okay, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you're happy about the Adobe change, then it sounds like best best model is in best continual pay model or best model for anything. Ah, uh, they'll start. They'll start. <laughs> We'll save all no, this. Save that no, for I, the good stuff. I am a big fan of like, give me a complete game. I'll, I'll pay once and. I I am a fan of, you pay for the amount of time that you plan on playing for it and get access to everything. End of story. You know I, that's that's me, and I may be the only one in her. I may be the odd oh, guy in the room, but that's I, all right. Lightning I, Crisis I wants me to pay you, I, I agree with you for games that require server communication where there's some other I'm overhead. talking MMOs. Yeah, I'm okay. talking MMOs. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, no, yeah. yeah. When there's some kind of, like, for a fighting game, I don't expect... <laughs> New Street system. Fighter requires you to pay 50 cents a match. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back to the old days. I don't know how the, how the client server model for that works when you sync up with people, but I'm pretty sure that it's it's peer to peer and somebody just acts as the server in a lot yeah, of those Neko Fest just said the best thing ever. What about arcades, Bridger? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I just said we bring it back to oh, okay. arcades. Right. If you send some Well, match. I mean arcades worked, right? They they worked. Until they stopped they working. working. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, but there was a But there they was had a competition with games games that you didn't have to pay fifty cents a match for. Once you got a console, <laughs> I could play Super Mario Brothers as many times as I wanted for one low price. <laughs> but you didn't uh. get the, the satisfaction of hating the guy who was hogging the machine. <laughs> I didn't. To, and talking to other people who also hated that guy. <laughs> damn that guy. All right. <laughs> there are no, it's, it's, da no it's damn that. that it's damn that ten-year-old DDR player, Bridger. Grr. It's it's that it's that kid. You pra you practice for two weeks straight at home on your DDR mat, and you go to the mall, and it's that ten-year-old kid that just makes everybody look bad. <laughs> <laughs> I I was okay. That may they may be a little reminiscent of my own life, but anyways. <laughs> All right, I, so I, I might have been that ten-year-old kid. <laughs> So Rob, we got to finish Monaco at some point. I want to play some more Monaco. We got to yes. schedule that. I, I have been doing it some more with uh, the other people. All right, and you know we're uh, recording Rogues Gallery tomorrow night. 
tomorrow night? Isn't it a week from tomorrow night? Was it? Oh, sorry, uh, Rogues Gallery. I thought you were talking about the... Oh, no, I was... it was. Yeah, Burning Wheel is a week from tomorrow's night. Rogues yes. Gallery is supposed to be tomorrow. Um, yeah. And... yeah for, some reason, for some reason, I thought... Because isn't the Rattle and Rogues or something like that? Oh, yeah, that? we called it the Rattle and Rogues, didn't we? So uh, I immediately went to that one. But yeah, I was the one who set up tomorrow night. For... Yeah, okay, just making sure, because I talked to Josh. He said he has not read through uh, Planet Hulk yet. Um, mm. And he thought we should just do one episode tomorrow, potentially. Um, That's fine, depending on what he wants to. I mean, I haven't read through the Daredevil that we were apparently supposed to read through. Don't! But I've read so many other things. <laughs> All right. So uh, that, by the way, if you guys are interested, there's a link on the Team Legacy forums under – what the hell is it under? Under, like, general general non-gaming stuff uh, where we've got a, a podcast called The Rogues Gallery that, uh, that uh, my oh, friend new Josh has set up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, roguesgallerypodcast.com slash, or no, itunes.roguesgallerypodcast.com, and if you want the RSS, rss.roguesgallerypodcast.com. There you go. We talked about our favorite uh, comic books last time, and we're going to be talking about, actually, I don't know what we're going to be talking about, because Rob hasn't read the Daredevil one, and I and Josh hasn't read the, I'm the only one that read both comics, really? Seriously? A I guy who doesn't even own anything. Just not the right Daredevil. <laughs> All right, guys, guys, chill out. Game of Thrones is about to sh- come up Boo. on TV. Okay. I don't it's, have it's, cables. It's, it's, uh, it's oh, never. I can't talk to you anymore. <laughs> I I I read the books and I got so frustrated that I can't enjoy the series anymore. I can't enjoy the HBO because the books made me so angry. And I know that the the series is going to do the same thing that books made me angry for. So I can't watch it anymore. I just can't. I, I've given it up, and I'm just going to wait and curl up in my bed until Sherlock comes out in season three. Oh, man. You're missing out, Bridger. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right. We're all right close if you, the if you don't watch that, here. Bridger, watch a show called Hannibal. That actually is really good also. I've heard good things about that. What is – what – who's – what – what – Hannibal. What, what, what? See, there you go. That's good stuff. We're make, making progress, Bridger. Oh, it's an NBC go, show. Yeah, it's it's really good. Um, it surprised me actually. So, uh, but it's right up your alley, and I'll just leave it at that. I don't know about that. I didn't. I don't. I didn't like that. Well, I didn't watch the Hannibal Lecter movies. It's not. It's not portrayed in the same way. It's. Huh. It comes from a different angle. Okay. But uh, did you like? Uh, have you ever watched a show called Numbers? I did not. But that's because I was told that they had to keep coming up with more and more convoluted ways to work math into solving crimes. <laughs> but and then I there's that there's myself. that really famous scene from Numbers where they messed up what uh, IRC is really bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but anyway, uh, it's it's like a a, a detective type show. Please. Yeah, uh, sort of kind. Of, yeah, sort of kind of. It's like it's like um, CSI meets. Uh, uh, per, have you ever uh, – what's the name of that movie? Uh, Something Minds. Criminal Minds? Uh, Criminal Minds, yes. Uh-huh. Um, it's basically you have this this guy that um, is is like a genius, but he's it, the, his own genius is it makes him a little weird, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's very much like Numbers, which had a similar you know guy in it almost to a certain extent where he was so smart that it, it hurt him, you know, at times. Like but Monk. anyways – <laughs> yeah, just just watch watch the first show. Watch okay. the first uh, episode. I'll check it out. Give it, give it a go. I'll All right, I'm going to sign list. off. All right. Have a good night, everybody. I'm shutting down the stream.